This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. You're listening to the Qalam Institute podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Qalam is pleased to announce that admissions for the next Qalam seminary intake are now open. For more information, please visit qalaminstitute.org. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Inshallah continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Asirat nabawiyah the prophetic biography In the last uh, few sessions we've been talking about the Battle of Badr And we've of course taken our time as we try to here in this series um, discussing every aspect of this great uh, and landmark event, not just from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, but from all of Islamic history. Where we've concluded at this point is that we talked about the Prophet ﷺ arriving back in the city of Medina after the Battle of Badr had been concluded. So the battle has been concluded, the dead or the deceased, the shuhada, the martyrs from the Muslims have been buried, um, the, those who had fallen, who had died from amongst the Quraysh, they have also been um, you know, buried or their bodies have been disposed of. The Prophet ﷺ along with the prisoners of war has arrived back in al Madinatul Munawwara, the news has reached there. We talked about one of the very sad uh, you know, a tragedy in the aftermath of the Battle of Badr, and that is that when Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu ta'ala anhu arrives back in Medina with the news of the victory of Badr, he finds the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam returning back from al baqir the graveyard in Medina, after having buried the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who had passed away while they were away at Badr. So this was of course a very huge tragedy for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the loss of his beloved daughter radiallahu ta'ala anha, may Allah be pleased with her. So at this time, what we will be talking about is the news of the defeat of the Quraysh reaching Makkah al-Mukarramah. So the news of the defeat of Quraysh reaching back to Makkah. And then we'll also today be talking about uh, the Meccans basically sending delegations and coming to Medina in order to be able to free the prisoners and some of the unique stories of some of the prisoners that were taken uh, after the Battle of Badr. So Ibn Ishaq, uh, rahimahullahu ta'ala, one of the early historians, he mentions in his seerah that, كَانَ أَوَّلُ مَنْ قَدِمَ مَكَّةَ بِمُصَابِ قُرَيْشِ الْحَيْسُمَانِ إِبْنُ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ الْخُزَاعِي so al Haysuman, this individual who was a Meccan, he was the first one to return back from the Quraysh, back to Mecca. فَقَالُوا لَهُ مَا وَرَاءَكْ They asked him what transpired with you, what happened with you. So he started, he was of course panicking, he was very flustered. And so he started rattling off names. قُتِلَ عُتْبَةُ بْنُ رَبِيعًا وَشَيْبَةُ بْنُ رَبِيعًا وَأَبُوا الْحَكَمِ بْنْ هِشَامِ which is Abu Jahl وَأُمَيَّةُ بْنُ خَلَفْ وَزَمْعَةُ بْنُ الْأَسَدْ وَنُبَيْهِ وَمُنَبَّهِ إِبْنَ الْحَجَّاجِ وَأَبُوا الْبَخْتَرِ بْنْ هِشَامِ فَلَمَّا جَعَلَ يُعَدِّدُ أَشْرَافَ قُرَيْشِ So he just kept rattling off the names of some of the most prominent members of the Meccan community. Some of the most influential leaders of the Quraysh just started rattling their names off to the point where it's, it, was, it started becoming very shocking. And after a while, it seemed like this can't be true. Find one leader, two leader, three leaders, right? But how have none of the leaders come back? Who is coming back then? So it started becoming very shocking, and he was in a huge gathering of the Quraysh, and he just keeps rattling off names. فَقَالَ Safan ibn Umayyah, Safan ibn Umayyah, one of the other leaders of Quraysh who was back in Mecca, who did not end up going for the battle, he said, وَاللَّهِ إِنْ يَعْقِلْ هَذَا فَسَلُوهُ عَنِّي Safan ibn Umayyah said that I think he's lost his mind. Like I honestly think that he's delusional, that he's suffering from some type of mental you know, instability or in a temporary bout of insanity. This, possi- this can't possibly be true. فَسَلُوهُ anni. He's just mentioning the names of everyone who matters in Mecca. So since Safan ibn Umayyah was a leader, he said, ask him about me. Like he seems crazy to me, so ask him about me. 
So they said, مَا فَعَلَ صَفَانُ بْنُ أُمَيَّا What happened with Safan ibn Umayyah? So he said, هُوَ ذَاكَ جَالِسًا فِي الْحِجْرِ He said, what do, you, what do you mean? He's sitting right there. Why would you ask me about Safan ibn Umayyah? He's sitting right there. And he pointed right at him. And then said, قَدْ وَاللَّهِ رَأَيْتُ أَبَاهُ وَأَخَاهُ حِينَ قُتِلًا But I will tell you one thing. I saw with my own eyes his father and his brother being killed in Badr. And so this, this is how the news of what had transpired at Badr reached back to Mecca. So it was a very, very shocking situation. Musa ibn Uqba, um, Imam Bayhaqi mentions this narration in his Dala'ilu Nubuwa, that Musa, Musa ibn Uqba uh, narrates that, لَمَّا وَصَلَ الْخَبْرُ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِ مَكَّةً That when the news of what had transpired in the battle of Badr reached back to Mecca, وَتَحَقَّقُوهُ And they were able to confirm the news, قَطَعَتْ النِّسَاءُ شُعُورَهُنَّ The women basically cut their hair as a sign of mourning. وَعُقِرَتْ خُيُولٌ كَثِيرَةٌ وَرَوَاحِدٌ and many camels and horses and animals were killed as like a sacrifice to the gods, right? To mourn the loss of those who had fallen in the battle. And there's multiple different narrations. One very fascinating narration that Ibn Ishaq mentions, and some other of the uh, scholars of the seerah and some muhaddithun mention as well, that Abu Rafi' Mawla Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Rafi' who was a slave, who was freed by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, later on, he actually relates this incident. Um, and Abdullah bin Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, learned this uh, incident from this man, Abu Rafi'ah, who used to be a slave in the house of Abbas. And then Ikrimah, who was the freed slave of Ibn Abbas, he narrates it from Abdullah ibn Abbas. Right? So you see the, the, the chain of narration. So Abu Rafi'ah, who used to be a slave, he says, كنت غلاما للعباس ابن عبد المطلب. I was a slave and I used to belong to Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet wasallam. Later on, Abbas gifted me to the Prophet wasallam, and the Prophet wasallam, he freed me. And so, so from that point on, he was known as Abu Rafi'ah, Mawla Rasulillah. He was known as Abu Rafi'ah, the one related to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Anyways, he says that وكان الإسلام قد دخلنا أهل البيت. At the time of Badr, mo- most of us in the uh, in our home, we were the family of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, of course. But most of us within the home, we had accepted Islam already. فأسمى العباس. Abbas had already become Muslim. Umm al-Fadl, the wife of Abbas, the mother of Abdullah bin Abbas, she had already accepted Islam. Wa aslam tu, and I was the slave of the household. I had also accepted Islam at this point. Wa kan al-Abbas yuhabu qawmahu wa yakrahu khilafahum. Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu felt a huge burden on his shoulders to maintain um, the position of his father. Abdul Muttalib was the great leader of Quraysh. That leadership was passed on to Abu Talib. Abu Talib, of course, you know, had spent the last decade of his life defending the Prophet wasallam, and eventually passed away. And so the leadership basically fell at that point to Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And so Abbas felt a huge uh, responsibility on his shoulder of taking care of the people. وَيَكْرَهُ خِلَافَهُمْ And he didn't want to cause any further discord within the community. وَكَانَ يَقْتُمُ إِسْلَامَهُ And because of this, he had continued to conceal his Islam. Many people did not know that he was Muslim at this particular point. وَكَانَ ذَا مَالٍ كَثِيرٍ مُتَفَرِّقٍ فِي قَوْمِهِ And he had a lot of wealth. Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu was very well to do. And that's why we talked about this earlier in the earlier session of the seerah when talking about the family of the Prophet ﷺ that Abu Talib had the responsibility of feeding the hujjaj people that would visit the Kaaba it was Abdul Muttalib's responsibility and he had passed it on to his son Abu Talib Abu Talib being a very poor man was not able to afford um, feeding all the hujjaj the visitors to the Kaaba so he had transferred that responsibility to his younger brother Abbas and so Abbas was quite wealthy and a lot of people in Mecca owed him money وَكَانَ أَبُوْ لَهَبْ قَدْ تَخَلَّفَ عَنْ بَدْرٍ فَبَعَثَ مَكَانَهُ الْعَاصِ بْنُ هِشَامْ إِبْنُ الْمُغِيرَةِ We've talked about this, that the narrations mention that when Badr happened, every known man, everyone who had any type of respect in Quraysh, went for Badr, and if they were not able to go for Badr, then they sent someone else in their place. Abu Lahab, who was very elderly, 
and cowardly, he didn't himself end up going for Badr. But what he did was he sent in his place Al-As ibn Hisham. And so when the news um, reached back to Mecca about what had transpired in Badr, Abu Rafi'ah says that, وَكُنْتُ رَجُلًا ضَعِيفًا I was a very, very frail, weak man. I was not a very strong person. And the responsibility that I had, what I used to do for the family was, I used to build, I used to make uh, pots. You know, like clay pots and things like that. I used to make them, and, that, and then they would sell them, and so that's what I used to do for the family. And so I was sitting, basically making the pots, and Ummul Fadl, the wife of Abbas was sitting close to me. And when the news reached Mecca about the defeat of the Quraysh, we were all Muslim, but we were all hiding our Islam. So he says, وَقَدْ سَرَّنَا مَا جَاءَنَا مِنَ الْخَبَرِ We were very happy when we heard that victory had come to Islam. And he said that so many of us had been living under so much fear and oppression in Mecca that the Muslims who were still in Mecca who are living under oppression in many cases, or being tortured, or just living undercover as Muslims. This was a huge moment, like it encouraged a lot of people to come out with their Islam, to announce their Islam. And many of the Muslims who were being oppressed felt that this was maybe the beginning of, you know, some type of victory for Islam and the Muslims. So he says, once the news had reached, and we were very happy about the news, and we were talking about what had happened, Abu Lahab came to visit us. And he came and he sat down um, on top of a little place. Um, basically, it was kind of like a, like a peg or something like that. And he kind of sat down on top of it, um, like a little bucket or something. And he sat down on top of it. And he turned his back towards me. Like he wasn't looking at me because I was just a slave. He sat down. And a little while later, he called for uh, Al-Mughira ibn Al-Harith ibn Abdul Muttalib. One of the gra- other grandsons of uh, Abdul Muttalib, a cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, Mughira ibn Al-Harith, he had come back from Badr. So he called him and he said, Halumma ilayya fa'indaka la amri al-khabru. Come and tell me what happened in Badr. Fajalasa ilayhi wa nasu qiyamun alayhi. So he came and he sat down and people gathered around. And uh, Abu Lahab said, "Yabna akhi, akhbidni kayfa kan amrun nas." He said, "Please tell me what happened with people over there." He said, "Wallahi ma huwa illa an laqin al yoma, fa manahna hum attafana, yaktulun na kayfa shau, wa yasirun na kayfa shau." He said that we went there to the battle. I swear to God, we went there and we did everything that we could. We fought our hardest. It was not possible for us to fight any harder than we did. But those People, the Muslims he means, they were able to kill us however they wanted. They were able to capture us however they wanted. I mean, they had their way with us. We couldn't do anything against them. وَأَيْمُ اللَّهِ مَعَ ذَلِكَ مَا لُمْتُ النَّاسَ And he said that, in spite of that, I don't blame our people. Our people could not have fought harder than they did. But this, there was something else that was going on there, where they just ran over us. They just went right through us. And he said, لَقِينَا رِجَالًا بِيَضًا عَلَى خَيْلٍ بُلْقٍ بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ And he said, that wasn't it. Then we met these men. We saw these men. They were wearing white clothes. They were riding these uh, fast horses. And it seemed like they were not even running on the ground, like they were floating in, floating above the ground. Right? They weren't even running on the ground. It's like they were flying above the ground. And he's talking of course about the malaika, the angels that came in Badr. Wallahi ma tuliqu shay'an wa la yaqumu laha shay'un. If they went by something, they destroyed it and eradicated it. And nothing could stand in their way. Faqala Abu Rafi'ah, Abu Rafi'ah says, فَرَفَعَتُ تُنُبَ الْحُجْرَةِ بِيَدَيْهِ ثُمَّ قُلْتُ تِلْكَ وَاللَّهِ الْمَلَائِكَ He said, when I got excited when I heard this, I stood up. And I said, Tilka wallahi al malaika. I swear to God, those are the angels, those are the angels. فَرَفَعَ أَبُوْ لَهَبْ يَدَهُ فَضَرَبَ وَجْهِ ضَرْبَةً شَدِيدًا So he said, Abu Lahab slapped me across, he punched me in the face as hard as he could. قَالَ وَثَاوَرْتُهُ And so he, he talks about this earlier, he says when the news from Badr came, it kind of gave us all a little bit of courage. I was a slave. 
living as a secret Muslim in Mecca. But because I heard about this news, angels coming and fighting in the battlefield, that when Abu Lahab hit me, I'm a slave. I, I'm a slave who belongs to his brother. Normally in the old days of Mecca, in Jahili times, he, in Jahili times, this was normal. To, to hit a slave like that, to strike a slave like that, and I wouldn't even make eye contact with him afterwards. That was the protocol in Jahili Mecca. But he said, now that this had happened, thawartuhu. I jumped at him. Like I said, okay, let's go. So I tried to fight him, but he says that, I w- kuntu rajulan da'ifan. I was a very weak, frail little man, and I kind of overestimated myself, I got a little too excited. And Abu Lahab is a very old man at this time, but he says in spite of that, فَاحْتَمَلَنِي وَضَرَبَ بِي الْأَرْضَ He says that he picked me up and slammed me against the ground, like body slammed me. And then he says, ثُمَّ بَرَكَ عَلَيَّ يَضْرِبُنِي Then he sat down on top of me and started just pounding away at me. وَكُنْتُ رَجُلًا ضَعِيفًا And he again says, I was a very weak man, I couldn't defend myself. But then he says, فَقَامَتْ أُمُّ الْفَضَلِ أُمُّ الْفَضَلِ The wife of Abbas, رضي الله تعالى عنه, the mother of Abdullah bin Abbas, he says that Umm al-Fadl stood up, إِلَىٰ عُمُودٍ مِنْ عُمُدِ الْحُجْرَةِ فَأَخَذَتُهُ She went and she grabbed like a, a big piece of wood, right, like a big stick. She went and she grabbed it, فَضَرَبَتْهُ بِهِ ضَرْبَةً فَلَعَتْ فِي رَأْسِهِ شَجَّةً مُنْكَرَ she hit him on the head with it so hard that it made him bleed from his head. He fell down bleeding from his head. وَقَالَتْ And she said, أَسْتَضْعَفَتْهُ أَنْ غَابَ عَنْهُ سَيِّدُهُ The owner of this slave is gone and you're trying to beat him up and trying to injure him and kill him. He, some, you know, that was her excuse to kind of cover the situation. I'm protecting my husband's property. This is my husband's property. This slave belongs to my husband. How dare you do this? But really she was just trying to save Abu Rafia from Abu Lahab. فَقَامَ مُوَلِّيًا ذَلِيلًا He got up and he left from there and he just looked humiliated. He was injured, licking his wounds and he looked humiliated. And he walked away from there. And this is one of the narrations and he says, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا عَاشَ إِلَّا سَبْعَ لَيَالٍ حَتَّى رَمَاهُ اللَّهُ بِالْعَدَسَ فَقَتَلَهُ فَقَتَلَتْهُ then he goes on to say that he lived for about a week after that, after which he was afflicted with some type of strange disease and illness, where basically like boils would appear all over a person's body, and the person would basically just rot away and just die. And he talks about how that, وَكَانَتْ قُرَيْشْ تَتَّقِي هَذِهِ الْعَدَسَةَ كَمَا تَتَّقِي الطَّاعُونَ The Quraysh used to treat this illness how people would treat the plague. So he ended up dying a week later. They made him stay in a separate place outside of the home for about a week. He lived for a week, injury, wound in the head. And so he had, after that point on, it's like he had severed such serious like head trauma, he had kind of lost his mind. And so he would yell and scream, he couldn't even talk anymore. Um, so it had caused him some serious head trauma. And then the illness on his body appeared, boils, and he was just... Very, just, you know, anten. Like he started to just rot and stink. And so they kept him in a small room, like a small little shack outside the house. And he ended up dying a week later. People could hear him screaming inside of that little shack. Nobody went to go check on him until he stopped screaming one day. Two days passed and his sons would not go check on him. Until finally somebody came to visit and they said, what is wrong with you? How disgraceful are you people? Your father seems like he died two days ago, you won't even go and dispose of his body. And they said that we don't want to catch that illness or disease from him. His, I mean, he was, he's disgusting. So we don't want to go near. And so finally, after uh, one, some, somebody came and offered their assistance, they find that the narration, one narration says that from afar, they just kind of threw some water on his body. And then they basically threw a cloth on top of him. They hired a couple of slaves to carry the, the body by the cloth, carry him. And they went outside of Mecca to where some of the mountains were. And they kind of put him there. And they just kind of like threw a bunch of rocks on top of his body to kind of cover it up somehow about halfway. And then they just walked away from there. And that was the end of Abu Lahab. So 
this basically transpired in the aftermath of Badr. And that's why Aisha Umm al-Mu'mineen radiallahu ta'ala anha, she actually narrates, it's narrated about her, um, that whenever, even later on, when she would visit back to Mecca, she knew where the house of Abu Lahab was, and whenever she would pass by the uh, house of Abu Lahab, she would cover up her face with a cloth and pass through there. Just remembering the fact that the enemy of Allah and His Messenger wasallam, used to live here. So she would cover up her face as she walked by. So at this particular time, once the news had reached there, Quraysh nahat Quraysh ala qatlahum. So according to their jahili tradition, they started lamenting and mourning the loss of the people, the, the Meccans who had died in the battle of Badr. So at that time, some people said that لا تفعلوا, don't do this. فَيَبْلُغَ مُحَمَّدًا وَأَصْحَابُهُ فَيَشْمَتُوا بِكُمْ That don't mourn the loss of your dead. Because if Muhammad and his people find out, then they will further curse you and they will make fun of you. And so don't mourn the loss of your people. And they said, وَلَا تَبْعَثُوا فِي أَسْرَاكُمْ حَتَّى تَسْتَأْنِسُوا بِهِمْ لَا يَعْرَبُوا عَلَيْكُمْ مُحَمَّدٌ وَأَصْحَابُهُ فِي الْفِدَاء And at the same time, nobody send any type of money or ransom for their family members who might be held prisoner there. Because Muhammad and his people then, they might take advantage of you. And it goes on to mention that, you know, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala has a very interesting comment here. He says, وَكَانَ هَذَا مِن تَمَامِ مَا عَذَّبَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَحْيَاءَهُمْ فِي ذَلِكَ الْوَقْتِ Those who survived the battle of Badr, this is how Allah punished them. وَهُوَ تَرْكُهُمْ النَّوْحَ عَلَىٰ قَتْلَاهُمْ فَإِنَّ الْبُكَاءَ عَلَىٰ الْمَيِّتْ مِمَّا يُبِلُّ فُؤَادَ الْحَزِينَ Crying over the loss of a loved one is sometimes the only remedy for the heart of the person who feels the pain of the loss. And especially in Jahili times, the only thing that you could do when you lost a loved one, when you lost a loved one was to cry over them and to express your grief over their loss. And so at that time, Ibn Kathir rahimullah ta'ala says, this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was punishing them. That they were deprived of even mourning the loss of their loved ones. And there are numerous different stories about um, some men. There's an elderly man, Al-Aswad. It talks about him, how he had lost three sons. And because of this, you know, kind of um, everybody saying, don't mourn the loss of your loved ones. Nobody cry, nobody mourn the loss. If, you know, you have family members who are held prisoner, don't send any money to receive them. This old man would just continue in private to, you know, keep... Um, you know, crying over the death of his sons, until and people would keep reprimanding him until one day. One time, it's a very interesting story. Ibn Ishaq mentions he heard the sound of a woman crying. He was blind, and he heard the sound of a woman crying at night. So he says to his um, servant, "Undur hal uhil nahbu." Go and see. Are we now allowed to cry for the loss of the people who died in Badr? So, فَهَلْ بَكَتْ قُرَيْشٌ عَلَىٰ قَتْلَاهَا are, are now people in Quraysh crying over their loved ones? So he says, لَعَلِي أَبْكِي عَلَىٰ أَبِي حَكِيمَ يعني وَلَدَهُ زَمْعَىٰ So he says, maybe then I can cry over the loss of my son. فَإِنَّ جَوْفِي قَدْ احترق. I feel like I'm dying inside. Because I can't even express how sad I am at the loss of my son. فَلَمَّا رَجِعَ إِلَيْهِ الْغُلَامِ قَالَ إِنَّمَا هِيَ إِمْرَأَةٌ تَبْكِي عَلَىٰ بَعِيرٍ لَهَا أَضَلَّتُهُ The slave comes back and says that, no, no, that was just a woman who was crying because she lost her camel. And then at that time, you know, he has some shi'ar where he says, أَتَبْكِي أَنْ أَضَلَّ لَهَا بَعِيرٌ وَيَمْنَعُهَا مِنَ النَّوْمِ السُّهُودُ فَلَا تَبْكِي عَلَىٰ بَكْرٍ وَلَكِنْ عَلَىٰ بَدْرٍ تَقَاسَرَةِ الْجُدُودُ وَعَلَىٰ بَدْرٍ صَرَاتِ بَنِي هُسَيْسٍ وَمَخْزُومٍ وَرَهْتِ أَبِ الْوَلِيدِ وَبَكِّي إِنْ بَكِيتِ عَلَىٰ عَقِيلٍ وَبَكِّي حَارِثًا أَسَدَ الْأُزْرِ أُسْوَدِي وَبَكِّيهِمْ وَلَا تَسْمِي جَمِيعًا وَمَا لِأَبِي حَكِيمَةً مِنْ نَدِيدِي أَلَا وَقَدْ سَادَ بَعْدُهُمْ رِجَالٌ وَلَوْ لَا يَوْمُ بَدْرٍ لَمْ يَسُودُ And he basically said that, Oh woman, you cry over the loss of your camel. If you want to cry over something, then cry over the loss of my sons. 
They were supposed to be the leaders of their people. And now today people are taking the reins of leadership. If Badr never would have happened, those people would never be leaders because my sons would be there to be the leaders of their people. But they were taken from me in their very young age. So this was the situation in Mecca post Badr. And how much just, you know, anguish there was in Badr. Uh, there was in, in Mecca after the battle of Badr. So you see the joy on the side of the Muslims and you see the anguish here in Mecca on the side of the Quraysh after the battle of Badr. Now basically, we've talked about how the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba, Istawsu bihim khayra. Treat your prisoners very well. And the narrations talk about how the Sahaba themselves lived off of a couple of dates a day and they would feed bread and any type of food that they had to their prisoners. Taking care of them, keeping them in their homes. And so now the people of Quraysh, they kept encouraging everybody in Mecca that don't send any, don't send any ransom to free your loved ones because we don't want to give Muhammad um, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, the gratification. So don't send anything to release. So finally, um, it mentions that um, one of the uh, individuals one, uh, who was taken prisoner, Abu Wada'a, his son, basically Al-Mutallib ibn Wada'a, he snuck out of Mecca at night, وَنْسَلَّ مِنَ اللَّيْلِ وَقَدِمَ Madina, And he came to Medina and then he brought money and freed his father by paying the ransom. And that was the first individual from Mecca to come and pay ransom. And once everyone in Mecca saw that Abu Wida'a was able to come back, now the floodgates opened and people started coming from Mecca every single day in order to free uh, their brothers or their sons or their fathers, their family members, um, and pay their ransom and take them back home. Um, Suhail bin Amr, who uh, was one of the individuals who was taken as a prisoner after the battle of Badr, and not only that, but Suhail bin Amr would also be the individual who would sit on the other side of the negotiating table during the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So he fought against the Muslims in the Battle of Badr. He was taken as a prisoner. Not only that, but he would continue to remain a staunch opponent of Islam, preventing the Muslims and the Prophet ﷺ from going and performing Umrah, you know, enacting the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which was very lopsided, and so he was taken prisoner at the time of the Battle of Badr. He was known to be very outspoken against, not just outspoken against the Prophet ﷺ, but also to verbally attack the Prophet ﷺ. And so Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, allow me to knock his teeth out. Let me kind of rough him up a little bit. Let me knock his teeth out. He likes to speak against you. He likes to say bad things about you. I want to break his teeth and I want to see what he, like, what he can say after that. Because when somebody came to ransom him, he was like, he's going to go back to Mecca and he's going to pick up from where he left off. So Ya Rasulullah, before he goes back, let me kind of fix him up a little bit. And the Prophet wasallam said, No, no, absolutely not. We do not justify, we do not allow the mutilation of people. We don't do that to prisoners. We don't injure them and mutilate them in this way. So absolutely not. He didn't allow it. Not only just that, but then the Prophet wasallam said something remarkable. Ibn Ishaq relates that the Prophet ﷺ at that time said to Umar radiallahu anhu, إِنَّهُ عَسَى إِنَّهُ عَسَى أَنْ يَقُومَ مَقَامًا لَا تَذُمُّهُ A day will come where he will stand in a place, in a position. And what that means in the Arabic language is a day will come where he will do something where you will not feel this way about him anymore. A day will come very soon where he will do something so remarkable that you will not feel this ill will towards him any longer. Ibn Kathir rahimahullahu ta'ala says, وَهَذَا هُوَ الْمَقَامَ الَّذِي قَامَهُ سُهَيْلْ بِمَكَّةِ Let me tell you what Suhail one day later on did in Mecca. حِينَ مَاتَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ When the Prophet ﷺ passed away, وَارْتَدَّ مَنْ ارْتَدَّ مِنَ الْعَرَبِ And many of the tribes around Mecca apostatized. They left Islam. They turned against the Muslims. وَنَجَمَ النِّفَاقُ بِالْمَدِينَةِ وَغَيْرِهَا 
And many of the munafiqun rose up at that time. When the Prophet ﷺ passed away, everyone who still had hatred in their heart against Islam, they rose up at that time. Now now's the time to strike. So a lot of the tribes who had only accepted Islam to try to you know, um, be on the right side of the conflict, they all turned on the Muslims. The munafiqun who were laying low, all came out of hiding. They all came out of the woodworks. And فَقَامَ بِمَكَّةِ Suhail bin Amr who had become Muslim at the time of Fathu Makkah, the conquest of Makkah, he stood up in Makkah. فَخَطَبَ nasa, Like he gathered the people in the Haram at the Kaaba. And he spoke to the people. Like gave a khutbah, he spoke to the people. وَثَبَّتَهُمْ عَلَى الدِّينِ hanif, And he said, stand firm on your deen. Things might seem like they're going haywire right now. The, yes, the Prophet ﷺ has left this world. And yes, many of these tribes around Makkah have turned on us. And yes, many of these munafiqun are trying to rise up in Medina and overthrow Medina. But stand firm on the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's the one who rallied the Muslims in Makkah and kept Makkah strong and held Makkah down. And this was something prophesied by the Prophet ﷺ, you know, eight years prior after the battle of Badr, where he told Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, number one, you are not allowed to injure him in this way, because that is not permissible. In the sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that is not allowed, number one. And number two, Suhail specifically, he's going to do something really remarkable one day. So just wait for that day to come. Right? And so this was something that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had prophesied and he had predicted at that time. Another, um, so the one who came to free Suhail bin Amr, he did not have enough money to free him. His name was Mikraz. He didn't have enough money to ransom Suhail. So he basically said, why don't you let Suhail go and اِجْعَلُوا رِجْلِي مَكَانَ رِجْلِهِ وَخَلُّوا سَبِيلَهُ I will stay here in Medina, you let Suhail go, and then when he gets to Makkah, then he'll send some money, um, to free himself, and at that time you can release me. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, no problem. فَخَلُّوا سَبِيلَ سُهَيْلِ وَحَبَسُوا مِكْرَزِ عِنْدَهُمْ And so they let Suhail go and they kept Mikraz in his place. And then Suhail went and sent the money, and at that time Mikraz was also released. Another incident mentions that the, one of the prisoners of war was the son of Amr ibn Abi Sufyan. The son of Abu Sufyan was, was, was one of the prisoners taken at the time of uh, Badr. And again, um, the word was sent. Uh, so the word was sent to Abu Sufyan that you should free your son. And so he said, He's already got my son. Another one of the sons of Abu Sufyan, Hanzala, who had gone to fought in, fight in Badr, he had died in Badr. So he said, I lost a son. Then my son was taken, another son was taken prisoner. Now you want me to pay for the ransom of him. How much am I going to give up to Muhammad and to these Muslims? And he said, so absolutely not. Leave him there. Da'uhu fi aidihim. Yumsikuhu ma badalahum. Let them keep him as long as they want. He was just so furious that he said, let them keep my son. And so somebody else at that time, so one of the Muslims ended up going back to Mecca. And so Abu Sufyan at that time found out that a Muslim was in Mecca. And that Muslim, his Islam was hidden. It was not known that he was Muslim. And so when he came to Mecca, he came under the guise of wanting to do Hajj. Even just the Jahili Hajj. Like I'm coming to visit the Kaaba. And it was a sacred it was a sacred thing. It was understood that if somebody comes, even if your enemy comes to visit the Kaaba, you don't lay a hand on him. Because the Kaaba is sacred. And we are the custodians of the Kaaba, the Quraysh. That's the least we can do. We don't lay hands on anyone who comes with the intent to see the Kaaba. But Abu Sufyan violated that. And he ended up taking him prisoner and then sent the word to Medina that I have one of the Muslims over here. And at that time, the Prophet ﷺ released the son of Abu Sufyan to secure the release of that Muslim who had been taken prisoner by Abu Sufyan. Right? So again, you see the Prophet ﷺ valuing human life over any type of ransom or grudges or anything like that. 
Another very unique incident of a prisoner that was taken at Badr was the son-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The son-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whose name was Abu Al-As ibn Rabi'. He was taken prisoner. He was the husband of Zainab, radiallahu taala anha. He was married to the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Zainab. Bin to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and so it's actually mentioned. Just to give you a little bit of background about this, Abu Al-As ibn Rabi'a, he was the nephew of Khadija radiallahu anha, the mother of Zainab, Khadija radiallahu taala anha. He was her nephew, so he was Zainab radiallahu taala anha's cousin, and Khadija radiallahu taala anha had proposed the marriage. She came to the Prophet ﷺ. This was before Islam, and she said that one of my nephews, Abu Al-As, he's a very good, young, dependable, reliable, honorable man, and so I would like to marry our daughter to this nephew of mine. And this is narrated by、um, Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham as well. And they say something very interesting. وَكَانَتْ خَدِيجَةَ هِيَ الَّتِي سَأَلَتْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَنْ يُزَوِّجَهُ بِإِبْنَتِهَا زَيْنَبَ وَكَانَ لَا يُخَالِفُهَا And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم did not used to disagree with Khadija, meaning that Khadija رضي الله تعالى عنها was ذات رأي. She was امرأة ذات رأي، ذات رشد. She was a woman of great intellect, a woman of great guidance. She was an extremely intelligent. Very sound, like in her process and her intelligence and her understanding. She was a woman of great understanding. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to acknowledge that about her. And so when Khadija radiallahu taala anha would make a suggestion, kana la yuhalifuha, he would not disagree with her. He would say yes, okay. So when Khadija radiallahu taala anha made this proposal, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam accepted it. Wa dalika qabl al wahi. This was before revelation. This was before prophethood. Similarly, one of the other daughters of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Ruqayya, she was married to, she was、um, engaged, she was engaged to Utba bin Abi Lahab, Utba ibn Abi Lahab, the son of Abu Lahab, the nephew of the Prophet sallallahu, or the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, excuse me, the son of Abu Lahab, Utba. When the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam announced his message, his mission. At that time, Abu Lahab was so furious. He goes to his son Utba, who is engaged to the daughter of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, and he demands from his son that you break off the engagement with the daughter of Muhammad. And Utba basically went ahead and did that. And at that time, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم married his daughter Ruqayya to one of the first believers, somebody who accepted Islam on the second day of prophethood, Uthman ibn Affan. And this is the same Ruqayya who then passed away at the time of Badr. And similarly, Abu Lahab goes to Abu Al-As, the husband of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم's eldest daughter Zainab, and he similarly makes a demand of him. He says, "I need you to divorce the daughter of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم." Fariq sahibataka, wa nahnu nuzawjuka bi ayi imra'at min Quraysh shi'ta. You divorce the daughter of the Prophet, so someone will marry you to any woman you want. You divorce her, and at that time he said, "La wallahi idan, I will never do that. La ufariqu sahibati, I will never divorce my wife. Wa ma uhibu anna li bi imraati imraatam min Quraysh. That I don't see a single woman in Quraysh that I would take over my wife. She is the most remarkable woman from Quraysh. Wa kan Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم يثني عليه في سهره. وهذا ورد في الحديث الصحيح في صحيح بخاري. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to praise Abu Al-As, and he used to say that he's the best son-in-law anyone could ever ask for, because he was such an honorable man. He used to treat the daughter of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم with such dignity, right? And this is one of the great values. One of the major things, and we th- this is kind of a side conversation, but this is one of the values that we have to really get back to emphasizing within our community. This is a part of the Sunnah. This is a part of the Sira. Right, that as much as we like to emphasize the rights and the authority、um, of a husband in a marriage in a relationship, 
We need to also emphasize the importance of the husband's responsibility to his wife. And the, the, the fard, the obligation of treating one's wife with dignity and honor. The Prophet ﷺ used to treat his wives with great dignity and honor and respect. He valued men. He married his daughters to men who were respectable and dignified, who were gentle and kind and generous and forgiving and merciful in their conduct and behavior. And he would praise them. Abu al-As was a very respectable man who treated the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ with great regard and respect. And the Prophet ﷺ praised him. Hadith in Bukhari, he praised him. Uthman ibn Affan was such a remarkable husband who treated the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, Ruqayya, with such dignity and respect and kindness and generosity, that when one daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, Ruqayya, passed away, he married his other daughter, Umm Kulthum, to Uthman. And the Prophet ﷺ said that if one daughter after another passed away, I would marry a hundred daughters to Uthman ibn Affan. That that's the type of man that you should marry your daughters to. That's a good husband, that's a good man. Ali bin Abi Talib, the Prophet ﷺ told Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, when he proposed marriage, when he told Fatima, I'd like to marry you to Ali. What do you think? And she agreed. The Prophet ﷺ told her at that time, that I have assessed all the young men in Medina, and he's the most honorable, the most respectable, the most respectful the most kind and, and dignified man, honorable man that I could find for you. Right? So this is a great sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. To treat one's family. And a khayrukum, khayrukum, khayrukum li ahlihi wa na khayrukum li ahli. That the best and the most dignified amongst you is the one who is the best and the most dignified with his family. And I am the best in terms of how I treat my family from amongst all of you. I treat my family better than all of you do. And that is part of the virtue of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, so anyways, Abu al-As was somebody the Prophet sallallahu had no complaints about. That being said, Zainab bintu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aslamat. She was a Muslim, she was a believer. There's a little bit of a discussion here. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala enters into it. And part of our objective here, this is why we go into so much detail, is to talk about some of these details. We typically know that it is not permissible for a Muslim woman to be married to a mushrik man, to a non-Muslim man. Abu al-As had not yet accepted Islam. The daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, had accepted Islam. So Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala talks about was she still married to Abu al-As or not? So he says that some of the historians and some of the authors of the seerah have said some very strange things here. But he says that if you actually look at the revelation of the ayat that make it impermissible for a Muslim woman to be married to a non-Muslim man, those were revealed in the sixth year of hijrah in Medina. Those ayat would be revealed four years after Badr. So at this particular time, because of the very delicate situation of Muslims and the very new situation of Islam within the community, that command had not come down yet. So the marriage of the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, who was a Muslimah, to this man Abu al-As, who was not yet Muslim, was still yet completely valid and permissible. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ allowed her to remain with her husband. Alright, so Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala clarifies this issue. Nevertheless, uh, Abu al-As was taken prisoner. The daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, Zainab bint Rasulullah ﷺ, she sent um, some money to secure the release of her husband. وَبَعَثْ فِيهِ بِقِلَادَةٍ لَهَا كَانَتْ خَدِيجَةً أَدْخَلَتْهَا بِهَا عَلَىٰ أَبِ الْعَاسِ حِينَ بَنَا عَلَيْهَا that when Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha was married to her husband, one of the gifts that her mother had given to her, her mother Khadija, one of the gifts that she had given to her is that she had taken her own necklace that was given to her by the Prophet ﷺ. She took her own necklace and gave it to her daughter as a gift on the night that she was married. On the day that she was married, her marriage. The day she was married, her wedding day. 
And that necklace, Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha had it. And she sent that necklace as, it was one of the most valuable things she possessed. So she sent it to secure the release of her husband. فَلَمَّا رَآهَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم رَقَّ لَهَا رِقَّةً شَدِيدًا When the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم saw it, he became extremely emotional. Extremely emotional. Right? Like his, he, he was very deeply affected by it. Because it reminded him of Khadija رضي الله تعالى عنها. Right? And how much he missed her. And what a remarkable person she was. And how much he loved her. And it was very difficult for the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ at that moment, he turned to the Sahaba, and he said, "In ra'aytum, This is remarkable. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see leadership. Right? And this, again, you can't help but notice the contrast to the tragedy of leadership that we have today in the world and in the ummah specifically. The Prophet ﷺ is Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the messenger of God. He is sahibul wahi, sahibul sharia. He receives divine revelation. Everything he says and does is law. He could say, release Abu al-As, hand him the necklace, send him on his way. He could say it, and it would become law. It would become wajibul ita'ah. The sahaba would have to do it. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا He took his responsibility of being a, a role model, uswatun hasana, so seriously, that he knew every single thing that he did would be documented, would be recorded, would be remembered, and would be taught and learned. And we would look at what he did and conduct ourselves accordingly. So he didn't just say, release him. He said, in ra'aytum. If y'all are okay with it, an tutliqu laha asiraha, that you would release the prisoner, the husband of Zainab. He doesn't even say, my son-in-law, my daughter's husband. No, no, no. The, the, the prisoner related to Zainab. alayha alladhi laha fafalu. And if you are willing, if you think it's okay to release the prisoner and to return back her necklace to her, then you can go ahead and do that, if you think it's okay. Subhanallah. Right? And of course the Sahaba, what are they going to say? Naam ya Rasulullah. Of course, O Messenger of Allah. فَأَطْلَقُوهُ وَرَدُّوا عَلَيْهَا أَلَّذِي لَهَا They released Abu al-As and gave him the necklace and told him to take it back. The only thing the Prophet ﷺ did at that time, Ibn Ishaq records, that the Prophet ﷺ قَدَ أَخَذَ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يُخَلِّيَ سَبِيلَ زَيْنَبِ he just said one thing. He said, you will allow Zainab to come and join me here. يعني أن تهاجر إلى المدينة That you allow her to come to Medina. She is a Muslim. She is my daughter. She belongs here with us. So you will allow Zainab to come and join us here. Her family, her community. فوفى أبو العاص بذلك And Abu العاص kept his promise. And he allowed Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha to go and join the Prophet ﷺ and the community of believers in Medina. Different scholars, different historians, Ibn Ishaq mentions then the story of the hijrah of Zainab at this particular place. Some other historians like Bayhaqi and Ibn Hishan and Ibn Kathir, they mention it a little bit later on because it did not happen at this time, it happened a little bit later on. And so inshallah we'll talk about it accordingly, we'll talk about it when it comes up in the timeline because it would make more sense chronologically. And basically to wrap up here, there are a couple of other uh, you know, stories and incidents where the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, um, one other uh, prisoner of war, he, you know, his family basically said, leave him, we don't want to send any money to ransom him. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he complained to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ released him. Another man comes to the Prophet ﷺ, Saifi. Ibn Abi Rifa'a, he comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says that, I promise that when I go back, 
I promise that when I go back, I will send money for my ransom. Just let me go back to Mecca, and I promise I'll send something. The Prophet ﷺ released him. وَلَمْ يَفِيلَهُمْ And he never ended up sending anything back. But the Prophet ﷺ said, no problem, let them go. Another man, and this is kind of a tragic story, another man, Abu Azza, Amr ibn Abdullah, he comes to the Prophet ﷺ, he was a Jumhi, he comes to the Prophet ﷺ, and he says, look, I have a lot of responsibilities back in Mecca. I'm the breadwinner of my family. Nobody can afford uh, to send anything on my behalf. Please let me go. Just out of the goodness of your heart, you let me go. And I promise that, you know, you, I will never forget this. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I will release you right now. وَأَخَذَ عَلَيْهِ أَلَّا يُظَاهِرَ عَلَيْهِ أَحَدًا as long as you do not take up arms against the Muslims ever again. That's it. You don't come into this fight ever again. And I'll release you right now. The Prophet was very merciful, merciful, very compassionate, right? Very understanding. And so Abu, uh, he said, Yes, yes, I promise I'll never fight against the Muslims. So the Prophet released him. And Abu Azza spoke some poetry in the praise of the Prophet ﷺ. It's very beautiful. He says, مَنْ مُبْلِغٌ عَنِّي الرَّسُولَ مُحَمَّدًا بِأَنَّكَ حَقٌ وَالْمَلِيكُ حَمِيدٌ Who will deliver the message from me to Muhammad ﷺ that you speak the truth and that your master, he is worthy of all praise, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَنْتَ إِمْرُؤٌ تَدْعُوا إِلَى الْحَقِّ وَالْهُدَى عَلَيْكَ مِنَ اللَّهِ الْعَظِيمِ شَهِيدُ that you are a man who calls to the truth and to guidance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the great, the almighty is the witness to this fact. وَأَنْتَ إِمْرُؤٌ بُوِّئْتَ فِينَا مُبَاءَةً لَهَا دَرَجَاتٌ سَهْلَةٌ وَسُعُودٌ And you are a man who has done a great favor to me. More, a greater favor than you can ever understand or realize. فَإِنَّكَ مَنْ حَارَبْتَهُ لَمُحَارَبٌ شَقِيٌّ وَمَنْ سَالَمَتْهُ لَسَعِيدُ He says, because anyone who takes up arms against you is a terrible person. And anyone who makes peace with you is a very fortunate person. وَلَكِنْ إِذَا ذُكِرْتُ بَدْرًا وَأَهْلَهُ تَأَوَّبَ مَا بِي حَسْرَةٌ وَقُعُودُ He says, whenever I am reminded of Badr, and what happened at Badr, regret and remorse overtakes me that I should have never gone for Badr. I should have stayed at home and never fought in Badr. But Ibn Kathir rahimahullahu ta'ala says very regrettably, this man Abu Azza, he broke his promise to the Prophet ﷺ. Ibn Kathir says, his explanation is, وَلَعِبَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ بِعَقْلِهِ Unfortunately, some people talked him into some foolishness. And he got talked into this foolishness. فَلَمْ فَرَجَعَ إِلَيْهِمْ He came back to fight against the Muslims in Uhud. He came back to fight against the Muslims in Uhud. And he was again taken prisoner at Uhud. And he again asked the Prophet ﷺ, أَنْ يَمُنَّ عَلَيْهِ Do me a favor. Please let me go. Release me. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ لَا أَدَعُكَ تَمْسَحُ عَادِ ذَيْكَ I'm not going to release you for you to break your promise again. تَقُولُ خَدَعْتُ مُحَمَّدًا مَرَّتَيْنَ I fooled Muhammad twice. In another narration, Ibn Kathir mentions that this is the occasion where the Prophet ﷺ said the famous, the very well-known hadith and wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ, لَا يُلْدَغُ الْمُؤْمِنُ مِنْ جُحْرٍ مَرَّتَيْنَ A believer is not bitten from the same snake hole twice. Like a believer is not bitten by a snake at the same place twice. And he says that, وَهَذَا مِنَ الْأَمْثَالِ الَّتِي لَمْ تُسْمَعْ إِلَّا مِنْهُ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةِ وَالسَّلَامِ This is the wisdom that only comes from the Prophet ﷺ. And so it's very sobering, right? But you see the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ as well, that the Prophet ﷺ at this particular time had this individual, Abu Azza, he had him executed at this time. And this is where you see the wisdom and the, the, the leadership 
And the difficult decisions the Prophet ﷺ had to make. He showed him compassion. He showed him mercy. He released him. He let him go. Just told him one thing. When Quraysh come back to fight, because they will. When they come back to fight, you don't come back with them. That's all you have to do in life. And you'll be okay. And he couldn't keep that promise. He came back to fight again. And killed Muslims in the battlefield. And so at that time he was taken prisoner and he was executed eventually. And the Prophet ﷺ said, because a believer learns a lesson. And this is both a hadith of Bukhari and of Muslim. And so then there's many other stories that basically talk about what transpired with some of the prisoners of war. Um, the most interesting, and I'll end with this, I'll conclude with this. The most interesting of the stories that's told is that one of the individuals whose son was taken prisoner at the time of the Battle of Badr, his name was Safwan. His name was Safwan. So Safwan, he said that his son who was taken prisoner at the Battle of Badr, he said that, you know, he couldn't live with the fact. He was like, no, I can't go on. My son was taken prisoner. He didn't have enough money to go and free him. And he was just in a state of just total unrest and complete misery. He met with, or excuse me, the name was Umair. Umair was the name of the man. His son was taken prisoner at the Battle of Badr. And so Safwan ibn Umayyah, one of the leaders of Quraysh, went to go visit him. And he was consoling him. You know how sad is it that your son was taken prisoner by Muhammad and his people and so on and so forth. And I can't believe that happened to you. You should take revenge. And he's like, no, I'm trying to raise some money. Do you think you could help me? Safwan said, sure, I'll give you the money. He said, you know, I would, send, take the, I, would, uh, I would free my son, but I don't have enough money. Safwan said, I'll give you the money. But still think about it, how humiliating it is for you. That your son was taken prisoner like this, and you can't do anything about it. You should go and you should take revenge. He said, I would, but you know, the problem is that I have all these financial responsibilities here. I still have other family in Mecca. Safwan said, I'll take care of your family. He said, I owe a lot of people money. He said, here, I'll pay your debts off. He said, I don't have transportation. He said, here, I'll give you transportation. And he basically removed all his excuses, and he kept kind of like enticing him, kind of like kept firing him up, hyping him up, to the point where Umayyad, he sits down, he takes a sword, he dips it in poison, he sheathes the sword, and he sets out towards Medina. And he said at that time, "La rakibtu ila Muhammadin hatta aqtulahu." I will go to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Medina, and I will kill him there with this sword. So, Safwan ibn Umayyah basically completely set him up and set him out on his way. And Umayr just told him, he said, "Faktum anni shani wa shanak." Just don't tell anybody that I'm going to do this. So Safwan said, "Saafal, don't worry, I won't tell anybody." So now Umair he sets out. And Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu was sitting with a group of Muslims in Medina outside of the masjid and they were talking about Badr. What happened at Badr. And that's when this man Umair he arrives there in Medina. And as Umair is walking by, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu sees him and recognizes him from Mecca and knows that his son is one of the prisoners. And he sees that Umair has, he's walking towards the masjid and he's drawing his sword. And so Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu sees him and he screams, هَذَا adu Allah, هَذَا adu Allahi Umair. This is the enemy of God, Umair. And he means something bad. Like he, he intends, مَا جَاءَ إِلَّا لِشَرْ He's come to do something bad. And so at that time, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu runs and he grabs Umair, grabs him with his sword and puts the sword to Umair's neck. And he shoves him into the masjid. And he starts screaming at the people around there, many of the Ansar are there, hurry up, hurry up, everybody get inside and form a circle around the Prophet ﷺ. Right, just in case. He slips out of my hand, form a circle around the Prophet ﷺ, protect him. 
And so all these Ansar, they run inside and they circle around the Prophet ﷺ. In walks Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu holding this man with the sword to his neck. And the Prophet ﷺ sees what's going on and he says, Mada ya Umar? What's going on? And so Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, Hada Umair bin Wahab. This is Umair bin Wahab. Qad ja'a mutawashihan sayfahu. He came drawing his sword at the masjid. Like drawing out his sword at the masjid. He intends bad things. Like he intends to harm you, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet ﷺ said, فَأَدْخِلْهُ alayya." Bring him to me. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala who brings him in, بِحَمَالَةِ سَيْفِهِ فِي عُنُقِهِ فَلَبَّبَهُ بِهَا He was holding the sword to his neck. Brings him in. And he says, he tells the Ansar, gather around the Prophet ﷺ, فَإِنَّهُ غَيْرُ مَأْمُونَ Don't trust this guy. This guy's slippery. He's sneaky. I know him from Mecca. When the Prophet ﷺ sees Umar radiallahu ta'ala holding him like this, he says, Arsilhu ya Umar. Release him ya Umar. And so again, sami'na wa ta'ana. We listen and we obey. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala releases him. And he says, Udnu ya Umair. Come close ya Umair. So Umair bin Wahab, this man, comes close to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, An'imu sabahan. An'imu sabahan. That used to be a greeting. They would say in jahili times, kind of like saying good morning. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Qada akraman Allahu bi tahiyyatin khayrin min tahiyyatika ya Umair. God has honored us with a greeting that is much better than this greeting, ya Umair. And then he tells him, Bis salami. Tahiyyati Ahlul Jannati. We say salam to one another. This is the greeting of Ahlul Jannah. And he says that. Um, so he sits down, and then the Prophet ﷺ says, Maja abika ya Umair. Why have you come here, ya Umair? He said that I've come to free my son. I've come to free my son. So he says, Fama balu sayfi unuqik. He said, what about this sword that Umar was holding to your throat? Why, why, why this sword? He says that, you know, I just came with the sword because, you know, you have to travel with the sword and things like that. But I didn't intend to do anything. He said, Uzduqni, maladhi jita lahu. Tell me the truth. Why did you come here? He says, ma jitu illa li dalik. I swear, I only came for this reason. I only came to free my son. Even though he had said, Wallahi, la rakibtu ila Muhammad fa'aqtulahu. I'm gonna ride to Muhammad and I'm gonna kill him. Right? He had said that in Makkah. But now he's saying, No, 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 Wallahi, I only came to free my son. The Prophet ﷺ said, Bal qa'atta anta wa Safwan. Come on, don't lie now. You and Safwan, you sat together, fil hijr, in your, in your house. فَذَكَرْتُ مَا أَصْحَابِ الْقَلِيبِ مِنْ قُرَيْشِ You talked about everybody who died in Quraysh. ثُمَّ قُلْتَ لَوْ لَا دَيْنٌ عَلَيَّ وَعِيَالٌ عِنْدِي لَخَرَجْشُ حَتَّى أَقْتُلَ مُحَمَّدًا You said, look, if I didn't owe a bunch of people money, and if I didn't have a family to take care of, I would ride out uh, to Medina, and I would kill Muhammad with my own hands. فَتَحَمَّلَ لَكَ صَفَانُ بْنُ أُمَيَّةَ بِدَيْنِكَ وَعِيَالِكَ Safan ibn Umayyah said, I'll take care of your debts, your loans, I'll take care of your family. عَلَىٰ أَن تَقْتُلَنِي لَهُ In exchange for you killing Muhammad ﷺ. That like you killing me for him. That was the agreement. وَاللَّهُ حَائِلٌ بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ ذَلِكَ But God didn't allow you to do that. Allah did not allow you to do that. Like he related the whole conversation that happened in the privacy of their home. فَقَالَ عُمَيْرَ أَشْهَدُ أَنَّكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ You have to be the messenger of God. قَدْ كُنَّا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ نُكَذِّبُكَ بِمَا كُنْتَ تَأْتِينَا بِهِ مِنْ خَبْرِ السَّمَاءِ وَمَا يُنَزَّلُوا عَلَيْكَ مِنَ الْوَحِي وَهَذَا أَمْرٌ لَمْ يَحْضُرْهُ إِلَّا أَنَا وَصَفْوَانِ We used to deny the fact that you receive revelation and that God communicates to you. But nobody witnessed that conversation except for me and Safwan. How would you know that except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you about this? So then he said, فَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي هَدَانِي لِلْإِسْلَامِ 
وَسَاقَنِي هَذَا الْمَسَاقِ All praises for Allah who guided me to Islam and made me arrive at this particular point. ثُمَّ شَهِدَ شَهَدَةَ الْحَقِ He gave his shahada at the hands of the Prophet ﷺ. Then the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba, he said, فَقِّهُ أَخَاكُمْ فِي دِينِهِ Now go and teach your brother about his religion. وَعَلِّمُهُ الْقُرْآنِ And teach him the Qur'an. وَأَطْلِقُوا أَسِيرَهُ And release his prisoner. Release his son to him. Teach your brother his religion. Teach him the Qur'an. And release his son. He's almost a brother now. We don't keep prisoners of Muslims. We don't treat our brothers that way. Release his prisoner. He spent a few days there in Medina in the company of the Prophet ﷺ, learning from the Sahaba how to pray, Qur'an, everything. He comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, إِنِّي كُنْتُ جَاهِدًا عَلَىٰ إِتْفَاءِ نُورِ اللَّهِ My purpose in life used to be to extinguish the light of God, to eradicate Islam. He says, شَدِيدَ الْأَذَىٰ لِمَنْ كَانَ عَلَىٰ دِينِ اللَّهِ I used to live to torture people who are Muslim. وَنَأُحِبُّ أَن تَأْذَنَ لِي فَأَقْدَمَ مَكَّةً I want you to give me permission, I want to go back to Mecca. فَأَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَإِلَى رَسُولِهِ وَإِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ I will call them to Allah, to, his, to the Messenger of Allah and to Islam. لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِيَهُمْ That I hope that Allah will guide them. وَإِلَّا آذَيْتُهُمْ فِي دِينِهِمْ كَمَا كُنْتُ أُوذِي أَصْحَابَكَ فِي دِينِهِمْ Otherwise, I will become a thorn in their side like I used to be in your side. I will, I will bother them about their religion the way I used to bother your followers about their religion. So give me permission to go back to Makkah. فَأَذِنَ لَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم فَلَحِيقَ بِمَكَّةً Now this man, Umair bin Wahab, he was known as a very fierce warrior. Right? And so he, wasn't, he was somebody that people in Makkah really didn't want to mess with. So when he gets back, وَكَانَ صَفَانَ حِينَ خَرَجَ عُمَيْرِ بِنْ وَهَبْ يَقُولْ أَبْشِرُوا بِوَقَعَةٍ تَأْتِيكُمُ الْآنِ فِي أَيَّاكُمْ تُنْسِيكُمْ وَقَعَةَ بَدَرٍ Safwan started telling people without telling them exactly what the plan was. When Umair left to Mecca, Safwan started telling people in Mecca that, listen guys, very soon I'm gonna have some news for you that will make you forget about what happened at Badr. Because he expected that Umayr is going to go back to Mecca and kill the Prophet ﷺ. He's going to go to Medina and kill the Prophet ﷺ. So he said, guys, I have some news very soon coming that will make you forget about everything that happened at Badr. Just wait for me. Just wait, I got some news coming. Umayr comes back, Safwan goes to see him, and at that time Umayr tells him that I am Muslim. Safwan is so furious. He says, I swear I will never speak to you again. I will never financially help you again. I will not keep any of my promises to you. But he really couldn't do anything because he was afraid of Umair. And so Umair said, fine, I don't need your help either. And Umair radiallahu ta'ala anhu started, he became an active da'i in Mecca at that time. And people couldn't mess with him. And it actually, Ibn Kathir rahimahullahu ta'ala says, فَأَسْلَمَا عَلَى يَدَيْهِ نَاسٌ كَثِيرٌ Many Meccans became Muslim because of him. Many people converted to Islam because of him in Mecca. And eventually he remained there in Mecca until eventually Islam, the Fatu Mecca, the conquest of Mecca happened, and Islam came to Mecca. He remained in Mecca, an active da'i in Mecca, continuing to convert people to Islam. رضي الله تعالى عنه may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him so again you see here the wisdom of the Prophet sallallahu and how the Prophet sallallahu invested into people he saw that this is not just Umair one man comes here with the sword trying to assassinate the Prophet sallallahu take him out no 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 this is Umair is not just one man he represents a family he represents a tribe he represents an entire city if we, if, if I can have an impact on him, if I can help bring light, guidance, iman, Islam to his heart, not only will one person accept Islam, which is valuable enough, a whole family, a whole tribe, a whole city could be changed. And that's how the Prophet ﷺ valued each and every single soul, and each and every single person. 
and recognize their potential and their talents and their abilities and use them to further propagate the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the objective and the goal was not to shed blood, was not to eradicate humanity. The goal and the objective was to save as many people from the fire of hell and bring them in through, into the gates of paradise. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything was said and heard. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to follow in the footsteps uh, and in the remarkable example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Mm-hmm.